years ago, a group of people <clears throat> took the decision to plant and establish a witness to Christ in one of the fastest growing areas of Brisbane, right here. We thank God for them, don't we? Was there anyone here still who's, who was here when it started? Well, well done you, sir. Well done you, yeah. Can we just pause to say thank you, Lord, for you, brother, and for all those who started the work all those years ago. In terms of the, the northeast of the city, um, in my judgment, there are two important places of witness which ground we had to take. One was Sandgate and the other was here. And you did that. And you've maintained your witness. Praise God. God be praised. And let him do it again. There are places where tens of thousands of people are moving into, uh, particularly on the south side, where I live. There are uh, extraordinary populations already in places like Flagstone and Yarrabilba and Ripley. Extraordinary numbers. And we need people of courage like our brother and, uh, and all those who were part of that important work. I give thanks to God for people who are prepared to do what is, and having been a church planter twice, I can tell you is one of the most challenging things you will ever do. But if you're up for extreme sports, I think church planting might be for you. <laughs> and particularly, let me just say this. The older I get, the more convinced I am that church planting is not an expert's game, it's a disciple's game. People who love Jesus and who are called to follow him, they hear his call and they risk all to do exactly what the master has said. So uh, who knows, there might be someone whose heart is stirred this morning, that's what I'm praying for. Anyway, let's turn in the uh, scriptures to Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. And it will be there for you, I think. Ah, there you go. You'll be able to follow along it there. Let me just read it to you. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel and in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Well, this is a church planting kind of story, really. And when you've been a church planter and you've researched church planting and you've coached it and you've trained it, it kind of gets in and you become nerdy about it. And so you're always looking in the Bible, you know, for, for, for stories that will kind of speak into your, your sense and your convictions. And this is one of those passages that it's always done this for me. Every new church, particularly in the first five years, will encounter life and death situations. Sometimes... Uh, if you have too many of them in the first three or four years, you don't last. It's that serious. And what you've got here is another one of those life and death situations for the new church. And it was, it was by no means clear that everything would work out well. It wasn't straightforward and yet, and yet it was another step in building the faith and resilience that they needed for what God had called them to. So the story before this passage starts with a miracle 
And uh, you, you probably know the story, right? The gate beautiful. Peter and John are going to the prayer meeting at three o'clock, walking through the gate. It's a lovely gate. That's why they call it the gate beautiful. But a lot of people will be sitting by the gate. They will be begging and the family members will bring their um, people with, without uh, limbs or, or not able to walk or not able to see and they will beg. And, um, and, and so people, they, they want to position themselves at the best places to get all the, the people who uh, will be convicted about charity and uh, Peter and John. Well, you know the story. We used to sing it. Who remembers that? Yeah. Yes, there are some young people in the room that are going, oh, no, he's, he's not going to do it, is he? He's not, he's not going to sing that song. Go, okay, let's do it. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I, oh yes, that's right, we forgot that. But such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went walking and leaping. Carry on, very good, you're doing well. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you will be saying in your hearts this morning, well, they don't write songs like that. And some of you are saying, good job too. <laughs> tells the story, doesn't it? it? It just tells the story. But of course, when we're in Sunday school, we're allowed to leap. And uh, when you were young, and you like leaping. And when you're old and you tell yourself, let's leap, and your body says, just Wait. It was a significant moment because this, this miracle would, was going to create, um, obviously it was going to create a breakthrough for the man himself and his family, but it was going to create a very significant moment in the life of the new church. And the apostles uh, there, uh, by the authority given them to Jesus, said, in the name of Jesus... Rise up and walk. Now, I, I love that story, and of course we want to see more of these things. I remember when I was a young man visiting the Philippines, and we were in a slum praying for the healing of men and women, because many of these folks um, did not have money for doctors. And I remember as a young man, just young in the sense of conviction that God was able to do abundantly more, it was all true and, and it was going to be amazing. And I remember that the, the family of this um, old woman um, brought to us, and she was bent over like that. And I remember thinking to the Lord, oh no, I'm going to... I'm going to pray for her. And that was a good learning lesson for me. And I decided not to pray around the world, if you know what I mean. I decided not to have a long, lengthy prayer. My mind went to the story again in Acts chapter 4. And so I laid my hands on her head and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, straighten up. And she did. Now, of course, everyone was thrilled. Yes, and I'm acting as though I've seen it all before. <laughs> but inside, I'm going, whoa, what just happened? It was amazing. It was amazing. I haven't seen this on a regular basis by any means, but I have seen it. And I give thanks to God for those sights. It was a wonderful thing. Peter and John said the words, the man got up and he went walking and leaping and praising God. Wonderful. Good story, right? Great way to end the day. Went to the prayer meeting. Woohoo! Someone got healed. He went walking and leaping in the name of Jesus. Great story, right? Except what happened here was that a whole, it unlocked a whole series of events. When Peter got into the, through the gate into the temple, he cut a left to go around through where Solomon's colonnade was. 
and people would be praying in there. It wasn't a kind of one prayer meeting where everyone was praying. It was a whole bunch of prayer meetings all around the colonnade. And um, because of the man, you know the story, a, a crowd gathered and he preached a good word, did he? Well, yes, he did, as a matter of fact. It was a good word, and that's in chapter 3 from verse 11 onwards. Marvellous story. Here's a, you know, if you're a church planter, what kind of things do you want to happen? Well, you want prayer for a start. Then you want some miracles. That's the start. And then a crowd to preach a good word to. That's a good thing. You know, so we're really going well here. Church planting 101 tells me this is the kind of day you want to have on a regular basis. And so he preached that word. And he finished off with this magnificent throwaway line almost. Chapter 3, verse 26. God, having raised up Christ Jesus, his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Great stuff. Speaking of the name of Jesus, you know, challenging everyone about their sins, you know. Woohoo! It's good stuff, you know. We get pumped for this kind of day. I mean, I wonder whether Peter and John had a sense that they was going. To, this is what's going to happen today. Yeah, oh Lord, that would be great. It wasn't in the diary though, was it, right? It was just prayer meeting, three o'clock. But now something is happening, something is going on which is profound and which is life-changing. Well, the apostles, you know, it was going so well that at the end of the uh, preaching, thousands of people came to Christ and uh, Peter and John went and planted a few more churches. No, in actual fact, they didn't. They got arrested. Now, I've been a church planter for long enough to know that your day can start out one way and end another. I've been around this stuff long enough to know that just when you think you've got the handle on it, you find you haven't. They brought a great word and then they got arrested. Peter spoke well to them, uh, those Sanhedrin people. He brought a very challenging word and chapter 4 verse 11 says, this Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you builders which became the chief cornerstone. There's problems here because I think for the religious leaders, uh, Peter has been using the Old Testament very well and they didn't expect that he could do that. And, and, and they ended up forbidding the apostles to preach and the apostles said in response in chapter tw uh, 4 verse 20, you, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's a great story, but hidden away in one of the homes of the believers was a group of people, and that's their prayer. That was their the situation for them. The people who had followed Jesus prayed, and the prayer is the subject of the reading. And there are three quick lessons that I want to leave with you this morning because we all know that every good sermon has three points. But the other thing, the other thing is it helps you know how close you're getting to Asha's celebratory food. <laughs> I've been around this gig, I know. It's all right. We're not going to knock that. So here's, here's the three things, because they all have to do with a challenge to every disciple of Christ concerning the, the age we live in and the need for churches. Um, let me just say, in my city of, of Logan... We need about 360 churches on fire for Christ to have any hope of reaching our city. We have about 130. What a challenge before us. Brisbane requires many more than that. If the number of, uh, the number of people living in the, pop, in, in the Brisbane LGA requires over 1,300 churches and you're not even close to that. There are so many demands. We don't reach our city simply by bringing, bringing big edifices and creating spaces where people come to see preaching because that doesn't happen now. We need churches that are active in their cities seeking its welfare. Men and women, boys and girls with such fire and passion for Christ 
the same as the apostles, we cannot help but say what we've seen and heard. We cannot help it. It's part of us. And what kind of people are we going to be? Well, here's a couple of lessons from our passage. The first one is in verse four, chapter 4, verse 28. God is sovereign. Sovereign over all things. It means our abilities and our strengths and our training are not sovereign. The buck does not stop with us. It stops with God. And God is able to do abundantly more than all we ask or think. The fact that God is sovereign is the source of the assurance that every one of us needs about our life. It means what, this is why we are prepared to risk. You believe God is sovereign? The stronger your belief that God is sovereign, the more likely you are to risk anything to see what he wants done. If you're not as convinced about his sovereignty, then you will risk less. We live, we live in places where believers are preferring safe places. Safe places where everything is organised and where everything makes sense and where everything works and when, where they are not likely to be in any difficulty. But in this life, we will have to face the fact that there is going to come situations where if we don't believe that God is sovereign, that we don't believe that the buck stops with him, if we don't believe that he is able to do in every situation abundantly more than all we ask or think, we are going to find ourselves less willing to take the risk. And so the very first thing that the people of God were beginning to learn was that their, their, their leaders had been arrested, their leaders had been threatened, they had been warned not to preach the name of Christ but their belief and their confidence in the sovereignty of God was such that they could not stop it. And this is the same call on us. We need believers to rise up in this time who are willing to risk anything. But you don't risk anything just because somebody tells you you should. You do it because in your hearts you know God is sovereign. He is able to do abundantly more than all I ask or think. No matter what is going on for me, God is sovereign. You need that kind of steel in your backbone when you're trying to do something for Christ. In this life, we, in, in my lifetime, sorry, we have shifted. In, when I was a young man, a, a little boy, um, the Judeo-Christian worldview was the centre of our culture as a country. We have shifted so far now that the central motif of philosophical core for the majority of Australians is cultural Marxism. And this means if we have not got the courage to face this, we are going to be in some serious trouble. So we need that conviction about the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. Governments may do what governments may do. We have governments in this country who are not supportive of Christianity. Some state governments are patently against Christianity and legislate accordingly. We will need courage to face this, friends. We will need courage. You will need all the courage you can to plant wherever God calls you. And we will need a vision of his sovereignty. Yeah, no matter whatever is going on, God is sovereign. He is able to do abundantly more. I'm trusting him. My trust is in him. I don't have it. You know, often I will hear some people say to me, how much training do I need to be a church planter? My answer, none. You don't need training. You get training because something else is going on. Do you see what I'm saying? In your heart is gripped with the sovereign call of God on your life. You need that. You get a little bit of training to make it easier, to make it a little bit more accessible, to give you a sense of it. 
The last thing we need, I need to give across to you, is that church planting is something you do because you're an expert. No, no, friends. It's not because you're an expert. It's not because you're gifted. It's not because you've got training. It's not because you're clever. It's not because you've got a good education. It's not because you've got money. It's because something is gripping your heart. It's stirring you beyond anything that's ever stirred you. And this is what this church had. And this is what God wants for us. To be so stirred that we hold the sovereign God. Oh yes, God is for us. And he is calling us. This is the first thing that emerges. We may have all this training. I, look, I'm not against training and education. I've got more letters after my name than in my name. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but, but here, what, what is the use of it? If I'm not prepared to take the risk, if I'm not prepared to launch out just because God's put something on my heart and I have no money and I have no ability and I have no training and I have no influence and I don't know what I'm doing, if something isn't gripping my heart, nothing gets done. Friends, don't be risk averse with the kingdom of God. The message about the king is so wonderful and so good. Let the sovereign God reveal that to your heart so that you have this big picture of him as a sovereign God, no matter what else happens. That's the first thing. Then in verse 29, you've got the second thing. This wonderful assurance about God's sovereignty means you're able to risk everything on the venture of making disciples. The scene that often I think of is from that Indiana Jones movie, if you remember it, where he stands looking to cross over between one, one place and another and he can't see where his feet will land. And remember he... Yeah. And he steps out. The scene shows us the moment we must all face... Sometimes you have to step out in faith when there's nothing confirming or reassuring about the way forward. But in our case, as we look at verse 29, we see there's an enormous confidence that comes from this assurance, and I've been mentioning that, and that the more convinced you are, the more likely you are to risk. Two amazing ideas. God is sovereign. That helps me make the, take the risk I need to take. And then in verse 31, when you take the risks to follow the call of the, of the Lord and his mission, you have the extra advantage of his promises. In chapter 4, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I've, uh, I've now got a few years under my belt, so I'm, I'm going on some experiences. I've been a church planter twice, so I know some of the challenges and difficulties of doing that. I've been a senior pastor, an associate pastor, a solo pastor and a church planter. So I've, I've got a little bit of experience to draw on. And there are lessons that I've learnt which no doubt hold me and help me. And that's good. I give God the glory. But what I have learned over the years is that nothing, nothing, but nothing beats the power of the Holy Ghost to do what we are called to do. And so we become, if we're wise, we become people who are hard after the Spirit. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit at every opportunity. But here's what I've discovered. We leak. Now you're wondering what I might mean by that, I guess. You get filled with the Holy Spirit... But I don't know about you, but I've, I've picked up those experiences where it seems like the very thing I was filled with, I, I lose it. I leak it. And I find myself having to come back to the Lord and to say, 
Fill me again, Lord. I remember as a young man, who remembers the old, the old uh, revival chorus? Touch me again, Lord. Touch me again. Wonderful healer, touch me again. The idea of, of this church was that God was sovereign, that taking risks was going to be what their lives would mean. Life and death risks, not just risking about some money issues, not just risking about some career issues, they're nothing. No, I'm talking life and death all around the world, right now, in countries, country after country. You can think of them. The countries like Yemen, countries like Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, North Korea. Men and women who own Christ, it's a life and death thing. We honour them, don't we? We remember those who are in chains today. What is the key? The key was that this church, faced with the risk it was facing, faced with the threat it was facing, they received the one thing that would kind of like tip it all over in the po into possibility. They knew God was sovereign. They were ready to take risks. But then the, then the Holy Spirit came and he filled them. And they preached the word of God with boldly. That's how they handled the threat. Just simple lessons, aren't they? Friends, we cannot do what God has called us to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled. This needs to be what you are praying for. This means, needs to be what you are believing for. It needs to be what you pray with each other for. Lord, fill us with the Holy Ghost. Don't leave us to try and do what you've called us to do without the power to do it. That was the lesson they had. Now, I've been a Baptist for over four, no, 31, 32, 33 years. I've had a great time. I grew up in the Salvation Army, so that might make you worry now about me. I don't know. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and I, you know things that trigger you? So don't touch that again, will you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, I've learned over the years that Baptists are real enthusiastic people, but you've got to be able to see inside them because they only get enthusiastic on the inside. <laughs> but let me just say, Salvationists are exactly the same. <laughs> the difference for us is, the difference for us is we need the, the working of the Spirit, the empowering of the Spirit, for only one reason, that we do need the power of God to do what God has asked us to do. I thank God today that my Heavenly Father does not ask me to do something without giving me the power to do it. I thank God today for that. I thank God today that when I'm faced with risks and threats, that I don't have to face that alone, that He is sovereign that the buck actually stops with him. He is the one who will carry this forward. And here's the promise of God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Friends, whatever else you may want, whatever else you may hope for, I pray that the work of God goes ahead not on the basis of your cleverness or your business acumen, not on the basis of your training and your education, not on the basis of your cleverness, not on the basis of your history or traditions, but on the basis of the, the work of the Holy Spirit filling you to overflowing, daily working and ministering the grace of God by his power. This was what they knew in Jerusalem and it's what helped them when they had to face the life and death threat they were facing. I don't know what you're facing, but I do know this, that God is sovereign. He will, treat, he will help you to take the risk. 
you need to take and he will fill you with the Holy Spirit if you ask him. So, we conclude with the idea Victory, victory in Christ comes largely out of obedience. I remember as a boy we used to sing a song we rarely sing now. When you walk with the Lord in the light of his... Remember it? What a glory he sheds on our way when we do his good will. He abides in us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Victory comes out of obedience, friends. Victory comes out of obedience. It doesn't come out of fear. Doesn't come out of all your preparations and your traditions. Doesn't come out of anything like that. Comes out of obedience. The Lord speaks his will and we do it. Victory comes out of obedience. And if you are sitting on the sidelines wondering what God wants wondering what God wants, I can give you a simple solution to beginning to find out what the will of God is for your life. Start obeying him now. Don't wait until it's all clear. Start obeying him now. You obey him now in your daily life now. You obey him now in your daily life now. We'll make it possible for you to reach out into everything else that God wants for your life. So many Christians, I find, are sitting on the sidelines waiting for God's will to be clear. Enough with the waiting on the sidelines already. Get into the fight. Obey him in something right now. It may be the very simple, the smallest thing that uh, you may be asked to do. You may not have what you feel you should have. You may, have, you may doubt your ability to perform it. In fact, I've often said to young leaders that I'm mentoring, and they say to me, Colin, I, I don't feel ready to do what God wants. And you know what I always say to them? Good. Good. I don't think I have the right training. Good. Excellent. Wonderful. And they said, I don't think you know what, I don't think you're listening to me. I, I'm I'm called of God to do something, but I'm not ready to do it. And all you can do is say, Good. Good. Wonderful. Hallelujah. Why? Because we don't need to know it all. I thought as a young man that I had to have it all understood before I launched out. What he's taught me since is don't worry. You take the step of obedience and victory will follow you. And it does. And so I say to you, I say to you, don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Don't sit on the sideline. No matter how old you are, no matter, you may think, well, I'm over the age of 65 now, which I am. And that's it for me. Well, I'll just, I'll take up Christianity as a spectator sport. <laughs> I'm going to watch them move. Four days before Christmas, the Lord asked me to spend some time with him in prayer with my wife. And so we did. I'm 67 years of age. And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do for the next 15 years. And I said, Lord, I'm going to be 82 at the end of that. When do I get to sit around and take spectator sport options? <laughs> he said, you will never do that unless you're disobedient. Oh, thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Friends, I conclude with this appeal. We can ill afford to be a people that sit on the sidelines, risk averse, wondering what could be done. Don't, don't worry that you may have not have what you need. Hear me saying to you, good. Don't worry that you may have not have all the knowledge you need. Hear me say again, good. Because all that we need is in Christ. And the fullness of God is in him. And he is in us and we are in him. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? I know you're Baptist, but on the inside, you must be thrilled with that. <laughs> Victory will come for you, friends. There's a great challenge for us. All around the city, it's growing. People are coming 
into our cities. Many of them don't know Christ. This is a great opportunity. Let's not just sit on the sidelines and hoping and watching and praying that somebody else does it. Let's get our hands dirty in this. Let's be working for the kingdom and for the king. And we'll work it out, he will work it out, and God will be able to do abundantly more. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. I mean, seriously. Praise God for his indescribable gift. Let me pray for you. No need to close your eyes and bow your heads. It's not a religious thing. <laughs> Father, uh, I speak faith and appreciation and hope over my friends here. What a privilege it is to be with them this day. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will come with great, with great power upon them, positioning them and uh, allowing them to become all that you have called them to be. Oh God, I pray that the Holy Spirit shall fill them to overflowing and that the impact of their lives will be felt all across the city. And I pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that there might be a quickening in them, that it is their chance to work for the King and to see the kingdom come on earth exactly as it is in heaven. The Lord be with you and help you and strengthen you.